be restricted to one day of celebration. It's got to be every day in very different aspects. Um, and they've got to be acknowledged all the way through. So, um, of course, that's, that's one reason why we're here on the 9th of March. But also when we speak about women representation um, in industries and in sectors, and when we talk about food industry and the hospitality industry, things have improved over the years. There's been um, an increase in, in the presence of women in leadership positions and all, all across. But there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of gender parity, uh, which is why we are at Food Safety Works have taken this initiative because there's a lot of challenges, a lot of opportunities, but probably as many challenges and as many questions that come in for women coming into the space or women who are already there. Um, so this is where Food Safety Works comes in with this conversation this month. We're looking at this, this opportunity to start talking about this, start celebrating the women that are there um, and which is why we've got three uh, amazing entrepreneurs in the food industry space in India. It gives me great pleasure to, to welcome our panelists today. So we've got Chef Aditi Handa uh, from the Baker's Dozen, uh, which is an artisanal uh, neighborhood bakery, uh, Pan India, and they specialize in sourdough bread. Uh, we then have Ms. Niharika Goenka, uh, who is the founder of Auricula Banco, which is India's first artisanal salad dressing brand. And we have Ms. Surabhi Talwar, uh, who's a co-founder of Happy Jars, uh, which is a healthy food brand focused on nut butters. Um, it's a pleasure having all of you here today, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Namika. Thanks. Okay. Great. So um, just to kick off the conversation, I, I want to start off with your individual journeys. Um, you've had very different journeys. You've had, of course, very different spaces that you're working in in the food industry. Um, and more so because the panel that we have today is literally a potluck um, of backgrounds and experiences and foods. Um, so we've got a psychologist and an HR expert. We've got a history and nutritional background with experience in environmental research and an economics, marketing and communications background. And then of course, with food, we've got everything from a healthy breakfast, from breads, from uh, nut butter spreads, um, from salad dressings. Uh, so everything for a complete meal. So let's start with Aditi. Uh, you're a psychologist and an HR expert who's turned into an artisanal baker. Um, so. Tell us a little bit about that. Tell us about where uh, the journey of Baker's Dozen started. And I think it was in 2013 uh, that you set up. Um, and what challenges have you had so far? I actually always wanted to study psychology and human resource uh, because I, I was quite keen on making a career in uh, training and development. But I think entrepreneurship in a way runs in our blood and once I finished my education uh, in England and I came back to India, what I was quite clear is I wanted to start a business. And I, my first project was with I Am Amdabad, which I did for about two years. Then I got uh, married uh, to my husband, who is also from I Am Amdabad. And uh, whilst he was working with McKinsey, we were trying to figure out, uh, is there something that we could do together? Is there a new business we could start? And in February 2012, we left our respective previous jobs slash businesses and got together saying, let's figure out what next in life. Mm -hmm. At that point, uh, it wasn't necessarily clear that we we're going to be in the food industry. It was just like, let's just start a business. All we wanted to do was be entrepreneurs. And uh, we met several people from different uh, industries. We met approximately about 60 odd people. Some people who were running Domino's, some people who were running old age homes, some people who were in tech businesses. And uh, in this entire research, we realized there was no good bakery in India that was selling bread. You know, bakery in India, uh, pre-2012-13 is um, something which sells bread, cakes, both. But, you know, bakery means bread and pastry means cake. So we said, this sounds interesting. Let us set up a bakery that makes good bread. Uh, but there was a catch. None of us knew how to bake. We only wanted to start it. So that was the first challenge. Uh, we found some courses in India which I attended, and I realized that uh, if we really had to learn this art and perfect this art, uh, we ha would have to find a course uh, somewhere in Europe, somewhere in the US. And that's when I went to get trained as a baker. 
at that point my intention was just to be one of those well informed bakers it was just you know one of those well informed managers ki manager just go thoda bahut leke aana chahiye but uh, my chefs of that they they were these really old school dedicated chefs to their art of it they actually didn't care about the commercials of it and uh, i remember it was on my fifth day of my class and i was baking a french sourdough and in that moment i knew that this is what my life is going to be about i am going to bake bread selling was not on the agenda trust me selling was not on the agenda i only wanted to bake bread and put it outside my house and whoever would want to take it uh, would just come and take it it was really as simple as that so that's how we started the bakers dozen uh this challenge of coming up with a product was the easiest of all challenges i see uh, because learning that was much easier problem was once we moved back to india and uh, starting a business can be so difficult uh, like from hiring people finding a shop you're going to sell in uh identifying where am i going to source my raw materials and uh, you know the the sad part about our food industry is nobody is really willing to help and mentor and that was becoming a big challenge because when we would write to uh, let's say established people in the industry they would find us uh, very threatening they would think okay listen now this new girl is going to come and she's going to bake and she's going to take over my bakery but you know like that's it you work like that it's not that easy so uh, customer education was a big problem because we started uh, with sourdough bread which is hard and crusty and not with butter and the bread all of us have grown up eating is you know soft sweet bread so customers would be but ye to sukhi hai this is hard this has gone stale so customer education was such a challenge but uh, you take it step by step uh, i used to bake through the night and then in the morning i would go to the store and sell so i would tell them this, this is what i did at 3 am in the morning this is how it's supposed to be i would do lots of free sampling saying aunty just take this bread and try trust me you will like it then i i think these were some of the initial fun challenges the irritating part started about a year later and this incident still bothers me today so we'd hired a delivery boy with a small truck so he would come to the bakery at 5 in the morning we would load all the bread and he would take it to our store and one day the union in the area just got together and said no you have to take trucks from our union at our rate there's no negotiating and that's when the first time it hit me that doing a business in india uh yes there's so much a little bit of product but there's so much of this paraphernalia and the irritation that comes with it that you have to tackle and you can't deny it you can't live in your little bubble you have to deal with it you have to deal with your driver turning up at 5 in the morning who's drunk and uh, you can't let him take your thing for you i used to put the crates in my car and say may delivery can be okay you go away so there were these little 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 challenges um, now things seem to be a bit settled and sane but those are the kind of challenges we faced when we started the bakers dozen with one store in 2013 now we're across about 450 touch points across india um through our stores through partner stores online and so on awesome so from one store to to this you've come a long way and i mean i completely understand i know that like you said within india um it's not just what's within your little store or your little you yeah. know outlet it's really the external environment which is probably the most deciding yeah. factor um whether it's setting up or of course running which we'll get on to the next questions uh, moving on to you um, niharika now you've studied history uh you've completed a masters in nutrition and then you worked in environmental research as well for some time uh what was the seed that led to aregula and I know that you you've mentioned I think that you're inspired by Michael Pollan who's an American author. Um tell us a little bit about that. Um so my journey is actually like more educational and I think within rather than experiential. Um so I studied history like you said and then I was like no 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 I don't want to be like a lawyer I don't want to be an activist I don't want to be in the government. Okay like let's just go study nutrition. I've always loved to you know work out. I like to eat healthy I guess. I I had a few eating disorders uh you know growing up. So I was like okay let's let's do this and so I went and I studied nutrition. And then when I was studying nutrition uh I was like okay I don't want to be a nutritionist like this is stressing me out like I can't like help people lose weight. Uh you know but uh but what ended up happening is that like my history mind kind of kicked into gear because I started thinking about food from from a very like macro perspective. I started thinking about 
food from systems, uh, from the lens of uh, food ecosystems, how food production happens, uh, how food wastage happens, you know, things like, you know, can we actually have enough food to feed the world? And where are we, you know, uh, like how, how do we need to change our diets to actually be able to feed the world? Uh, and some somebody who was very influential in that journey for me was this professor of mine called uh, Joan Dye Gassau. And, you know, when at the time when she was teaching me in 2013, 2014, 2015, she was uh, 80 years old and she would come to class with her walking stick. And as part of her class, she would actually take us to her house, uh, which was in upstate New York and show us her entire garden. She still ate off of her land. She still gardened. She still she still farmed her own land. And it was the most, and she's, I mean, I, I read, uh, I read, uh, I forget, Dan Brown, not Dan Brown, not Dan Brown, uh, the, the guy who started uh, Stone Barns at Blue Hill. So I read his book called The Third Plate. And he's actually written about how there were 12 founders of the farm to fork movement in New York and Joan Dye Gassa was one of them. So it was unbelievable to be her student. Uh, and I came back to Bombay and I was like, I don't know what to do with my degree because I don't want to help people lose weight, you know, uh, and it just wasn't my calling. And so I, I literally like went and I worked for uh, an NGO in environmental research and I worked on a solar project uh, that actually put, um, my, my job was to figure out the project proposal for how we can put uh, solar panels on the rooftops of schools. And uh, while I was there, a lot of my colleagues, which I was very close to, who I was very close to, uh, I would, you know, bring, I was, I was a little bit of a hipster. So I would carry like my salads and mason jars, you know, like really pretty looking salads. And, you know, I would like dress it really well. And, you know, they were like, wow, this is amazing. You know, you should do this. And, you know, and I was like, and then like, I, I kind of realized that, okay, I need to come full circle back to food. And long story short, I realized that I was passionate about impact at scale. And so the best way to do that for me personally was uh, to do it through FMCG. Oh, sorry, the Michael Pollan bit. Uh, I didn't answer that. Uh, so the Michael Pollan bit is, uh, so Michael Pollan is one of the most famous food writers. And what I love about his philosophy is that he simplifies nutrition. So he basically says, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And he has this fantastic little book, I think with 60 rules for eating. Uh, and really simple things, like if you can't pronounce the ingredient, don't eat it, right? So, so eat the way that your grandmother would eat. Would your grandmother recognize this food? And, you know, if, if it's food, it should rot, you know? And so I came from like this very like purist thinking of, you know, wanting to put good food, natural food out into the market and really simplify nutrition because the truth is that nutrition is a complex science and it's a very young science. So, I mean, you can't actually say that doing this will result in X, Y, Z. So if you, you know, cut down on, you know, if you start like, you know, having coconut oil first thing in the morning, that will cut down your blood sugar, right? Hypothetically. And so his philosophy was very simple. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And I wanted to create a brand around that. Awesome. No, I'm, uh, I completely relate to that. And, and you know, I'm glad that you did. Um, and of course, when you speak about not wanting to use your degree or not really sure about it, I think more so probably the best education um, is leading by example. And I think your faculty did that. You know, when you say an 80 year old woman with a walking stick taking you to her house and, and the farm. And then, of course, what you're doing, you know, with with the salad dressings and, and encouraging people to eat healthy. So really, I think that's the best education if you can lead by example. And we need that so much now. Um, moving on to, to Surabi. Now, you have a background in, in economics, marketing, and communication. Uh, so how did nut butters come into it in, in Happy Jars? Um, and has your previous uh, educational as well as your professional experience helped you in setting up the brand the way it is now? Um, absolutely. And I think all of it kind of happened just by chance. Uh, we call ourselves accidental entrepreneurs in a, in a sense, because uh, it was in 2016, my husband was actually leaving a riding job. So he's an equestrian national champion. He's been a six bar champion when he was in school, etc. So he's a very, very passionate horse rider. And uh, 
nutrition and health is something that he's always been concerned about and always followed and he used to eat peanut butter from when he was in school and uh, it was just one of the things that he started using a lot more for protein because he would ride horses in the morning work out in the evening he was a little uh, too much into the fitness at that time so it ended up being something he was consuming a lot and when he ended up looking at the labels one of these days he was like exactly what niharika said you know what are these ingredients i have no idea what they are i don't know why i need them and uh, looked up a few recipes uh, online and did some research started making his own nut butters so it was literally it, the inception was in our kitchen and the only things he used were things that he found in our kitchen and that's been his food philosophy from when he was growing up i think his parents as well have always been about eat fresh eat real don't eat things that are uh, chemically enhanced or you know functionally enhanced in any way so that philosophy really struck uh, struck him and when he started coming up with these flavors so he used jaggery instead of sugar just you know he south indian jaggery is very very popular ingredient with them so when he did that replacement the taste of the peanut butter was so amazing it was better than the stuff he tasted in the market and uh, when we looked up the industry at that time it was there were only four or five national players there wasn't really any interest around the nut butter category and when we discussed it one random night it just seemed so sexy as an idea you know i was like why is no one making nut butters like it's such a it's such a super food because it's it's got all the good ingredients it's got all the good fats it's very healthy for you everyone goes on about how you should eat it but there was no nothing interesting happening so i think it was a combination of a chance discovery of that product category passion of course for food which we actually discovered later uh, you know now my husband loves to cook and he's constantly doing these steaks and he's got a grill and Uh, he's discovered his passion for food i think after we started the business but the background in economics and marketing and um, the entire thought around business kind of helped to put a framework around the passion that we had so uh, i actually had to nudge him quite a bit into getting into the business because he was in between jobs and i was like you know this is the time that you're you're going to actually be able to put in hard work to get it started so why don't you try and if it works out then i'll leave I'll leave my job and and do this as well so he was actually running it solo for about a year and a half and then we moved to delhi we started in bangalore moved to delhi because i got a good job in delhi uh, so moved the business here it was quite small of course at the time and then uh, it just ended up picking up because we did a couple of the key things right in the beginning and that's where i think uh, the economics is what's kind of got me more analytical and problem solving in my thinking because it, it was and i i had the opportunity to study in a place which really forced us to look at concepts and not look at uh you know there was no by road really so it was about applying that concept to your own life and it made us think very differently about um about situations and then i think the marketing and brand building of course is is the thing that we rely on now understanding customers understanding insights uh, we built it as a brand uh, which i think some difficult as an fmcg product and as a young fmcg product to pay attention to things like labels and packaging and you know when all you want is money in the bank you're like wait why are you spending so much on designing a label for this thing uh, but it really helped uh, to get us to where we are now because we had very strong customer focused foundations right from day one um so i think yeah the the education always has a part to play and like i said the passion is something that we're actually still discovering now you know the, the, i think we've said more times than before starting it i think we were meant to start a food business and that's happened maybe in the last uh, last year that we really felt like we belonged in this industry so sure, no i'm i'm definitely i'm glad that you're all in um and of course i mean a common thing is you know is is not just the passion but also the mindfulness like you said the attention on labeling and and just that detailing getting into that detailing uh so apart from that um of course each of your brands um uh, very different in in what you offer as a product but there's a common thread that you've all got which is uh, natural and local ingredients um healthy habits and of course sustainable practices so whether it's from the people perspective or from the environment perspective so just want to talk about um what your brands stand for uh on those aspects and do you see a change um post covid and post what 2020 actually was Uh, so starting with you aditi uh, you look at local and uh, women employment um, women empower- empowerment as a very integral part of the brand so and your your journey why do you think that's important and so actually what happened is initially when we started in 2012 2013 we we want a uh, very pro hiring men or women we just wanted to hire hard working good talented young people that was really it um 
as the business grew uh, what we realized is women have a lot of responsibilities to juggle with and if they take up a job they are quite clear why they are taking it maybe it's a necessity maybe it's a passion uh, they are also quite dedicated so they would turn up on time uh, they would uh, do the job they've been asked to do in a limited period of time and i realized this was true across different avenues when we were hiring women in sales or when we were hiring women in the packing department in our uh, production in uh, bombay we found women to be a bit more dedicated and uh, you know the men used to come in night shifts and then they would just disappear and or they would come up drunk and i would be able, this cannot be the kind of work ethic you want and when we moved our uh, manufacturing to ahmedabad about 2 years ago and we hired uh, from local areas and uh, one thing we always said to the bakers that and we don't get skilled staff we always get the unskilled spend a lot of time training and mentoring them and they go forward in life and i found that the women were a bit more keen to learn this even if it was just a simple thing to give an example there's this girl who joined us in january 2019 in the packing department and all she used to do is paste a label on the on the box of bread that's all she kept doing every day but she would do very nicely and neatly and meticulously and then we said okay listen why don't you try doing quality check of the product and then she did that and then uh, she became better and better she would be regular she would want to learn more now she heads the qc department in the factory in that shift so i found this thing with women that wherever you put them they, because they they have a time crunch they want to perform better in a limited period of time they don't believe in wasting it they actually believe in developing it more and more and now when we are hiring more people in the upper management i find women work better there too uh it's easier for them i don't know how this works out uh, because they have more responsibilities especially during the pandemic when you know people have to work from home and manage kids and cook and do jharu pota and everything yourself women are still being able to do this they are still being able to perform better than the men so i'm so very clearly biased to with my women employees that work and all the men know that listen this is what is happening so we with me do a mentorship program and when we do training we do it across genders i just find a lot of women are more uh, responsive to it and they actually imbibe it and want to grow and uh, i think maybe there's a sense of ownership they feel a bit more which is why they are willing to spend more time to perfect what they're doing so this is how we go about developing women entrepreneurship at our uh, end awesome Okay, um now moving on uh, to you Neharika uh you're on a mission to enable um planet friendly eating habits um and of course you have a background on on nutrition and, and behavioral nutrition particularly is something uh, as well as education and and ethical packaging so can you tell us a little bit about how um Arigula works towards that and particularly that story about the soya sauce from a japanese community in alaba because honestly never heard of that before and i'm sure a lot of people are curious on where tiny japanese community comes in in alaba and how did this go about sure uh so the three pillars that you asked me about is is what you know i wanted to build a rugland co on so the first thing like you said is behavioral nutrition so this was kind of the training that i got when i was uh, doing my masters program so behavioral nutrition is the intersection of psychology and nutrition and uh, as research shows today that 85 to 95% of all diets actually fail uh, and they are failing because what we are doing is that we're assuming that knowledge is enough to create behavior change which is not the truth so if you go to somebody or if you ask a friend and if they tell you oh you should do this then that's good that's enough to make you want to do it which i mean i'm i'm sure that all of us know that from personal experience that nothing can be further from the truth so behavioral nutrition is the approach that it takes to actually meld psychology and nutrition and work with you on your behavior patterns to change food habits uh the way that we uh try and sort of instill that into a rugla and go and into our practice is that from day one we were very clear that you know salad dressings is not an easy category i mean other people face similar issues as you whereas you know a lot of people don't necessarily they don't eat salads as their you know daily meal right so it was a lot of customer education so what we started doing was that we gave recommended vegetable pairings with every bottle that we sold and this is content that's obviously available on amazon flipkart all of our you know we do the, we give you know these cards even to our vendors and what we also do is that we provide the same pairings in hindi 
because we realize that for our clients, the people who are often making the food in the kitchen is not the client themselves, right? So we wanted to be able to communicate uh, wider. So that's one example of sort of removing, you know, behaviors to change, uh, uh, barriers to change, sorry. Uh, the second part is nutrition education, which ties back into the whole Michael Pollan piece. Uh, and that is, I mean, built up on this whole idea that eat food, not too much, mostly plants. So we, based off of the USDA guidelines, we kind of veganized that version, if you might, or we, uh, you know, obviously we, we're not strictly vegan, so we do provide meat options as well. But we created a, a, a meal guide, whereas we suggest that make 50% of your plate vegetables, 25% protein and 25% green. Uh, and, you know, we, we provide that little card with, uh, again, across all portals. So that's the nutrition education bit. So simplifying nutrition. When you look at your plate, you should see 50% vegetables. And that's where, you know, most people, you know, kind of miss out on doing that. And uh, our tagline till date is uh, Arugula & Co. Eat More Veggies. So we wanted to build a brand around helping people, you know, increase their vegetable intake. Um and, um, and the last bit of it is the sustainability bit. So again, like I said, we're super passionate about sustainability. So today, 90% of our supply chain is organic and certified. Uh, our packaging today, we ship using only glass bottles. We have, we ship Pan India through our own website. We have less than 1% breakage. And we actually use a sustainable bubble wrap uh, to package each bottle when we ship products. Uh, so, you know, actually building sustainability from, you know, from the outset. Um, the, the Allahabad story is pretty cool. Uh, I was uh, trying to figure out my, my source, my supply chain, and I called up a friend of mine and his family basically imports a lot of ingredients into India. So I called him up. I'm like, hey, where are you? I need soy sauce. Do you have soy sauce? And he's like, no, I don't have soy sauce. But he, he was sitting in Rishikesh at the time at some ashram. And he, he was at a Japanese restaurant and he like looks over on his table. He's like, dude, this is a soy sauce that's really good. You should get this. And I was like, okay, send me a photo. And I looked it up and I was blown away <laughs> because it's true. There is actually a little small, like, I mean, small as in less than five people kind of Japanese community living in Allahabad. And it's, uh, it's basically called the Allahabad Agricultural University. And uh, somebody in the 60s from Japan came down to this university to actually, uh, you know, for basically like they wanted to sow Japanese plants in India, right? So they started off what is known as the Makino School of Continuing Education. And then as part of this school, which is still alive today, they make soy sauce. And this soy sauce is naturally fermented. They also, interestingly enough, make a kabuli chana miso, which we are using in some of our future products. <laughs> uh, and I visited them and they showed me their natural fermentation cycle. And uh, they're completely organic. They've empowered local vill villagers, you know, to like make these products. And uh, I like, it's one of the most phenomenal products that I've ever, ever, ever tasted in India. Wonderful, Kabuli chana miso. That's something that I'm, I'm definitely gonna look up. Um, <laughs> no, and once again, I mean, you know, like mm -hmm. I said, the truest education is leading by example, and not just what you're mm -hmm. doing, what they're doing as well. Uh, you know, with uh, just the ingredients and that little community keeping that alive, and of course, teaching so many. Um, Surbi, uh, so can you tell us a little bit about how Happy Jars focuses on local ingredients and sustainable practices, and has the strategy helped you or limited you? Uh, post last year's upheaval? So uh, let me start with how we focus on, on local ingredients. And I think most importantly for us, we focused on local um, flavors and that's where our brand kind of developed. So the fact that we were, we were, and I don't have data for this because it's so difficult to find substantiation, but we were one of the first brands in India to use jaggery in peanut butter at such a large scale. We were the jaggery creamy and the jaggery crunchy peanut butters that came out were, uh, you know, something that we developed because we didn't want to use a sugar and honey was a very well used ingredient, etc. So we specifically sourced out uh, jaggery. We also over the course of time have now developed a chili chutney peanut butter, which I'm extremely proud of because it is the so if you look at protein and you look at peanut butter, it is considered a, a sweet category and no one has explained why ever. It's just the way that it's been 
uh, it's happened in the West, let's say, right? And in India, we don't eat a sweet breakfast most of the time. Most of us will eat hot and spicy. We'll have your dosa and your paratha and, uh, you know, upma, whatever, uh, or eggs on toast, which is now, you know, a lot of people because they're looking for additional protein in the morning are having eggs on toast. And there was no peanut butter in that. And so we developed this flavor, which uh, again comes from the South Indian puri, which is your, uh, you know, slightly, spi- it's actually much more spicy when it's puri, but uh, it's something that I can put puri powder on anything and it makes it taste better, right? So we wanted something like that. And this flavor has been developed with, again, completely natural. It's peanuts. It's a bunch of spices you find in your house and salt. And that's it. And it's very mild. So we've kind of made it uh, edible for even younger kids and, you know, anyone in the family. So if you don't eat spice, you don't have to worry about it. So I think for us, the Indian consumer has always been kind of at the heart of what we've done. And as a result of that, all our ingredients are, of course, sourced from here as well. I think in the particular case of nut butters, our supply chains are already very well set because India is the second largest producer in the world of peanuts. So there's already a lot of production of that happening. So there's no exciting ways in which we found our suppliers. It was a very harrowing experience, honestly. I and mean, we still get harrowed about finding suppliers for peanuts because the rates are all over the countryside. And if you don't order in tons and tons and tons, you know, you don't get uh, you don't get good costs. But um, I think. The fact that we, of course, still source locally is important for us in most cases. It definitely helped during the pandemic. I mean, I think during the pandemic, supply chains in general, regardless of whether they were coming from within India or outside, were a complete miss match. I mean, we, no one had any idea what was going on. Uh, you know, our, while food businesses were allowed to stay open, so we got our license in a day to stay open and keep functioning, thankfully. But our uh, suppliers for labels weren't, our suppliers for jars weren't allowed, you know, so uh, uh, peanuts couldn't come from Gujarat to us anymore because the trucks couldn't make it past the borders. And that was much worse for stuff that was coming from international countries, of course, because there was no, so we got back to normalcy much faster because we have locally sourced ingredients. And I think within Maybe two, three months, we were back to the way that the supply chain used to be. But um, during the pandemic, we had to work with... So there was one hilarious story where we uh, went into the... And it was me and my husband managing everything for two weeks. We used to go in... And this was like literally back to day one. We used to go in, do jhadu pocha in the morning, then do the production, then clean all the machinery, then do jhadu pocha in the evening and come back and literally like just drop dead in the bed because that was all we had energy for because we couldn't call staff when lockdown happened and we couldn't pay people if we didn't have revenue. So we were really, you know, we had to really like tough it out. Um, But at the end of all of that, we went into office one day and we realized, oh, dude, there's no labels for these two products left anymore. And so we were like, but there are top selling products. So what are you going to do? So we made an appeal to all our customers saying it's exactly the same product, but can you please, please buy it? Even if we have just a handwritten note telling you what the manufacturing date is and what the product is. And you won't believe how kind people were. They actually had no problem. So we called every customer personally and told them, this is how we're going to do it until our label manufacturer can open again. Uh, And is that all right? And they said, yeah. So I think in terms of overall as a business, would we prefer to source from India? Definitely. In fact, uh, jars is something that very often large businesses will get from Hong Kong. It's the easiest thing for you to ship in a container. But we've chosen not to do that because we are we want to try and keep the economy here sustained. And like Aditi was saying as well, you know, a lot of our workers are not skilled labor. We take them on and then we train them um, on even things like machinery. And just to give you an example, the lady who's worked with us now for three years, so all our manufacturing staff is actually women, which is very unusual in India. And it's a very conscious call for exactly the same reason that we found them so willing to learn. Um, this lady came in, she was in her first job uh, with us. She'd never worked before that. Uh, She had a very ill husband, which is why she needed to get a job. Uh, During the course of having worked with us, unfortunately, her husband passed away as well. So she's now her own alone looking after two kids. Uh, And she is now our, uh, she's our main operator in the factory. She knows how to work every single machine in that place. She's in charge of the entire production floor. And she's learned all this just because she was on the job and she was learning it. You know, we trained her once or twice and then that was it. So we're extremely passionate about um, using local ingredients, using local uh, labor and helping to train them into becoming uh, bigger and better at what they do. Awesome, awesome. No, and, and I think, again, um, not just what I said, another common thread is really the the strength and the characteristics of women um, that are working with you and how they're willing to learn and, you know, and just explore beyond that comfort zone um, where they are brilliant. So 
And now just getting on to the next topic, of course, we are, uh, this is a food safety conversation. So we're gonna to touch upon that a bit. Uh, so quality and consistency, of course, are, are important for any brand and, and your brands have grown and, and now are recognized for that. The crucial and, and a mostly commercially ignored aspect is food safety. So across the supply chain, whether it's from procuring or preparation or sale or service, it's not just a regulatory requirement, but it's something that is a basic requirement that a customer has. And that, of course, that you, your name and your brand would stand for. So Aditi, where do you, what do you think that has changed for you in the recent past? Because you've got, you've built what's said to be India's first COVID and, and pandemic ready 25,000 square feet uh, factory. So what led to that? And, and food isn't a carrier. So is there anything beyond the generic uh, hygienic practices that you were looking for, that you anticipated that need to be implemented at your factory? Innovation is something we've always believed in in the baker's dozen, whether it was just taking a novel product like sourdough. And I see people who enjoy innovation, they do it just for the fun of it. They don't truly understand the benefit of it when they're doing it. You just do it because you feel that is the way to go forward in life. Now, uh, this factory got put up with the intention. What was happening is we were based out of Bombay when we started the baker's dozen. And we don't add any preservatives to our product, which means it's a shelf life of one, two or three days depending whether it's a bread or a cake. And we got all this customer love from Bangalore and Delhi and Ahmedabad saying that, why can't we get your product here? So we wanted to look at identifying a technology where we can increase the shelf life without adding preservatives to it. So we uh, went ac across Europe to see what they were doing. And there are two ways of doing it. Either you freeze it or you do something called a MAP packaging, which is basically remove all the oxygen. You know, everybody needs oxygen to survive. Similarly, bacteria needs oxygen to survive. So you remove the oxygen and uh, the environment becomes almost inert. And that's how you increase the shelf life. So that was our intention. We said, okay, great. Let us do something of this sort. Now, we are the only bread manufacturers in the country who do packaging like this because it's an expensive packaging. Now, what we believed in is that I have a very simple funda that if I can give this bread to my one, two, three-year-old child, that means it's safe. So what would I give to my own child is what I want to make for everybody else. And we said, this packaging will increase our cost, no problem. Our customers will be willing to pay the extra five, six, seven rupees that it will cost us because they're getting a more hygienic, a fresher, a more reliable product. And that can be paid off. Uh, initially, we struggled convincing customers because it looks quite bulky and it's plastic and so on. But uh, the pandemic, you know, the pandemic accelerated so many industries very, very quickly. And people love this packaging. They said, oh, great, I can dunk it in a bucket of soap water. So I like uh, when I can buy my bread and actually ensure it's clean and hygienic. So our idea was just to innovate. Uh, we obviously weren't aware of the pandemic. Uh, all the practices that we did was purely because I wanted to feed the same product to my child. I wanted to eat my own product when I was pregnant. And everybody's in laws are worried. Give it a sahi khao, achha khao, bacha hai, things like that. So we did it from that intention and uh, it really worked out there during the pandemic. Awesome. Um, yeah, no, it, it's very important uh, being mindful of, of course, what you're eating. And if you're, again, uh, something with you know what Michael Pollan also said that if, if your grandmother won't eat it won't recognize it don't eat it right so if you're not doing it don't have anyone else do it um, I, so Niharika how would how does Aregula look at food safety as a brand promise and have you had to redefine some of your promises um, most recently uh, you know post pandemic has there been some ch change that you've brought in uh, yeah, so I think uh, the facility that we have is still, you know, quite small. So it's not like, you know, we had to change a lot because we were already committed to a pretty high level of safety. I think for us, the, the key thing was, I mean, starting from two years ago when we launched Arugula & Co. I think it was just knowing what we could claim and what we felt comfortable claiming, right? So we started off with a 45-day shelf life. We increased it to a three month and then we increased it to a four month. Then we increased it to a six month. Today, we actually have shelf life reports that say that, you know, we're at an eight month shelf life, but we still only claim a six month shelf life. Uh, so, and you know, the ways that we did that is that we, you know, we honed in on certain CCPs a lot more. 
and uh, we tightened the screws and that kind of helped us you know carry through for like carry through that journey so i think food safety is also about being realistic uh, you know with your expectations and being realistic with your product so you know like aditi said that like you know initially she could only claim a 3 day shelf life and then you really have to innovate you have to uh, you know tighten the screws in order to actually take the next step and we're very deliberate and you know very uh, committed to that wonderful um right coming on to you survey now it, in the business of food um, a lot of people complain that that the regulations are, are quite difficult um, and confusing what's your take on that and how difficult has it been for you to stay compliant with with regulatory uh, requirements so uh, i think our perspective on this has always been twofold so one is uh, you know if you look at it split the perspective and just say what does regulation actually intend to do in the food industry and the point is regulation is there for safety when you are serving food and it's going into the mouths of people and it could potentially affect them quite seriously you want to be very sure that you are following the regulation the other side so it's extremely important to follow it the other side of it is how easy or difficult is it in the current systems to actually be compliant and i think those two are two very different things so in terms of importance definitely in terms of the process when we first started it was very difficult to even get a license because there was a confusion about whether you needed a state license or a central license or just a you know home homemaker's license etc and then when we applied for it in bangalore it took 8 months with no reverts from the agency we had an agent working with us as well which seems to be the only way you can get things done in india is hire someone who knows how to work the system um but none of that seemed to help and now i think over the last 4 years since we've done this the systems have improved tremendously i think there's been a lot of work from from the agencies and from the government and from fssai to really improve how the processes of these regulations are carried out uh, i think it's become much easier for people to stay compliant because everything is online yes there are certain, certain gaps but for example just last week i was on a conversation with the world bank who's helping uh, world bank and eui together are helping the government to plug these gaps in the in the process of food uh, of food regulation and then people like food safety works is so important in our journey because they are the experts you know outside of the government it is they they've taken it upon themselves to know what is supposed to keep a food manufacturer safe so i think for us people like that are very very important in our partnership to scale because uh in fact my conversation with uh, with Sarika as well has been that you know we've reached a certain point and we know we've done it right until now but when we scale further from here we actually need um expert guidance on what is required for the next step uh you know so i think we've of course been very very careful and conscious and you know we've got a one and a half year old daughter and she eats our nut butters every day so uh, it's physically not possible for me to be more careful about what i'm making because i know that she's eating it at home um and you know so we've it's tough as a journey to scale you do need to be compliant i think we still have a long way to go in terms of giving information out to people um and you know i think in india it's also business owners don't like we don't like doing our own work you know we want someone to do it for us we want to be spoon fed that's just a cultural thing uh because internationally you probably get even less help you know you don't have anyone who can log on to the website and put up your documents and do it all for 3000 bucks in india you do so i don't think we are left with any excuses as food businesses to not be compliant as long as we realize the government's not doing this or any of the agencies are not doing this to be barriers in your way they're actually doing it because it's extremely important and you must um so yeah i think splitting perspectives on it is is uh, just as important as being compliant absolutely and and again um, you know like you said you it is it's a journey right it's a journey that it's a collaborative journey where you've got to scale you've got to sustain and of course be safe yeah um, and it's so important so also i think for us we have to do it as and when we could you know different yeah. steps at different points in time but um yeah great okay so last round of questions before we uh, we get some of the viewer questions in um now there's a lot of women uh that are interested in getting into the industry at various points in the supply chain but they find it quite daunting because there's there's of course the gender gap um there's the patriarchal uh, ideology that we've got um sadly that that still remains and then there, there's this lack of awareness or or access to possibly education or training or maybe the most important which is peer groups um you know which is so important for women uh capital or just not knowing what market or just simply having an idea you know being absolutely passionate about it but not sure how to convert that into a viable business 
so again, Aditi, starting with you, what opportunities do you see for women in the space and what drove you to persist with it? Because what you've created, um, turning it into a viable business, your core offering, of course, you add on a lot more products now at Baker's Dozen, but your core offering is sourdough bread, which I think you swear by. So in the Indian context, like you mentioned initially in your journey, that was something which is not known of. And, you know, people say, thank you, we'll again. So what led you to kind of keep going at it and, and getting that change in the mindset um, and getting started on this? So, um, I think the beauty of food industry is like how Niharika, uh, sorry, Surabhi said earlier, is you can literally start with a product in your own kitchen. Maybe you're making it for your family, maybe you're making it for your neighbors, or maybe you think, listen, I'm just going to start something here and uh, see how it goes. And I think that's the beauty of the food industry, which is why I always tell youngers that you don't necessarily need a lot of backing or even a lot of support to be able to begin. Because start at a scale, you can actually do it. So a friend of mine, she um, she's actually a doctor by education and uh, uh, she has twin girls and she said, listen, I make really good idli dosa batter. So why don't I just make it and give it to my friends and neighbors and sell it to them? And now you see her product next to the ID product in uh, stores and I feel so proud that, uh, and she's taken her time to get there. She's taken three, four years to get there. But uh, it's been on her terms and conditions. She's been able to create her own environment and I think that's very, very important for women to be able to do. Take it at the pace you want. Uh, concentrate on your product throughout. Figure out innovation, which is what we've again done at the Baker's Dozen. We sold a two-day shelf life product for almost four years because we weren't ready to take it to the next level. We sold bread for three years before we even touched cake because I just felt cakes wasn't my calling at that point in life. So you take your time, you perfect it, you get comfortable, then you take it to the next level, which is why I think the food industry is a fabulous place for any young girl to be in. That's wonderful to hear. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people who are going to be happy to hear that. Uh, so Niharika, uh, going forward, do you see opportunities in, in a growing market for low carbon lifestyle and, and plant-based eating habits? And also, what are your views on e-commerce versus the traditional uh, brick and mortar or, you know, uh, physical stores for new people coming into the industry? Yeah, so, uh, so okay, the, the vegan question first. So I think that there are no stats. I was actually looking for some stats this morning, but we don't know how much of India has actually turned vegan per se. Uh, we do know that actually, I think 70% of India is actually are meat eaters. Uh, you know, so while the perception is that we are a predominantly vegetarian country, that's that's not the truth. Uh, and we are also, <laughs> I love how both of you are nodding. <laughs> uh, and also, I mean, we are the largest, we have the largest dairy industry in the world. We, ex we are the largest exporter of beef in the world. And I think uh, the more and more, you know, you have these market indicators that sort of suggests the way that, you know, people are changing their behaviors. And you see it, you know, when you go onto Amazon, vegan milks are very easily available. You've got tons of local players now, vegan cheese. You've got tons and tons of plant-based products. And, you know, interestingly enough, even Arugula & Co is a 100% plant-based, but we actually don't, you know, say that, you know, loud and clear because, you know, at the same time, we're just a generally delicious, good product, you know? So we kind of want to push forth the, the idea that, you know, vegan and plant-based can also be delicious. So I do think that in India as well, as awareness rises, I think uh, there's going to be a lot more vegans as we know it. Uh, the second question was, uh, sorry, what was your second question again? So um, e-commerce versus e your traditional brick and mortar physical stores. Sure. Yeah, so that's one of the coolest things about uh, being able to start a small business that, you know, all of a sudden you can just put up a website, it'll take an hour, you can create it and you can ship Pan India, you can run a few ads on it, the data is yours, uh, and you know exactly how the customer is responding. So for men, women alike, uh, you know, I think uh, e-commerce is definitely the way to build. But that said, uh, you know, India is also primarily uh, a country that, uh, that buys via physical retail. So as you scale, it will be a more and more important part of, uh, of where your revenues come from. Great. Uh, right, um, now Surbhi, um, last but uh, not the least, 
how important do you see network building uh, be for women, uh, not just to target uh, a segment or, or a clientele, but even for peer learning and growth? And considering the fact that we've got such poor representation or, or equality in terms of you know, gender parity in the industry. Um, and can you also, because I know you started off with actually uh, trying to get out on the nut butters out on fen, friends and family. How did you manage to actually get beyond that and identify a market for it? Um, so I think the first question that you asked first, networking is one of the main differentiators sometimes between a business making it and not. And it's a skill that women are not maybe naturally good at because we tend to be brought up saying be independent and be self-reliant. So asking someone for help sometimes is daunting. I know we say men don't like to ask for directions. They like to figure it out on their own. But I think for me as well, it was hard in the beginning to ask, you know, to be like, how do you do this? How do I get this done? Can you help me with this? Because it's like taking a favor and you don't want to take favors. But I've realized over the years that if you don't ask, you don't get. And it is your birthright to ask, right? So even with me, uh, I mean, I, always, I will always answer questions for anybody who writes to me on any channel about anything. Uh, if it if I feel it's going to help them to progress forward. I think for us, the most important learning on the networking front also, because both me and Vikram are not networkers. He's even, even more introvert, I think, than I am. He's very friendly, but he's not the best at going and making random conversation with strangers. That's probably my forte. And I've kind of tried to build that over time. We were both of us responsible for opening the first 70 retail stores in Delhi ourselves. So we walked around, pitched the product, talked to the store managers, went out there and got rejected and thrown out day after day after day, which for us was a networking exercise because today those 70 stores are still the best performing stores that we have. And we know the owners by name and the managers by name and they will call me and they will tell me, Apka sales banda nahi aaya aaj. and I will know, I mean, I've got eyes in the market because I know those guys. You know, so that level of networking is just phenomenal. And I think we don't learn enough from our peer group if you're not going out and making those friends and be pushy. There's nothing wrong with being pushy. Go and ask 65 different times uh, if you have questions about it. And I think um, even today for us, the product market fit is a direct uh, is a direct outcome of having had good relationships across our network of business. Most importantly, I think for me, I want to learn from other people's mistakes. You know, so when and networking to me was pushed to the hilt when the day COVID uh, lockdown got announced, I remember we we were living in Gurgaon at the time. We had a six month old baby. Yeah, six month old baby. And uh, me and my husband were like, listen, we're not going to, we live in Gurgaon. The factory is in Okla. The baby is with us. My parents live in Delhi, right next to the factory. It was all over the place. So we moved the whole house to my parents' house the day before lockdown got announced. And then lockdown got announced and I was like, this is it. This is the end. We've struggled two and a half years to build this business. And today we are back to the first day that we started. So in my panic, I reached out to all the friends I knew who were in the F&B business. And you won't believe it. In 24 hours, we had 40 different F&B brands on a WhatsApp group started by me. And everyone was like, listen, how are you getting passes? How are you doing this? Are your guys going to Gurgaon? Did someone get beaten up at the border? How did you get the passes? I mean, it was mad how people were helping each other. And I would not today, I'll tell you honestly, I would not have survived the pandemic with my senses intact if it hadn't been for that group. And one year on now the pandemic, at least the fear of the pandemic has passed us, but we still ask each other questions on that group on a daily basis. Do you have jar suppliers? Do you have carton suppliers? Do you have this and that? It's so easy to build a network but I think it all starts with that one mindset of you have to ask for that you have to ask for help you have to reach out you have to be brave and you know the worst that's going to happen is you'll get told no that's it and I just very quickly an anecdote we at the we're at the park one evening my daughter's one and a half but she doesn't speak yet okay so she's COVID kids are late developers, whatnot. I'm not stressing about it, but she just doesn't talk. Okay, no mama, no papa, nothing. Now there's these bunch of four or five-year-olds who are playing in a corner. And she is, Miss Madam decided, I want to play with those big people. So she's walked over to them and she's pointing and going, hmm, 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 at all of them. And she's just doing it continuously. And those kids are like, yay, why is she staring at me? What is wrong with her? And that's the kind of confidence we all need to have. Like I looked at her and I'm like, you are, this is exactly what I want for you in life, you know? You go get it. And if you get told, no, that's fine. You stand there quietly, but you go get what you need. So absolutely. I think it's, you have to develop that skill. You have to force it on yourself. Yeah. 
Absolutely, and, and your daughter is definitely um, going to be an inspiration uh, growing up on that. A bully. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you need you need that as well. Um, you you do need that. I think um, the situations where you need uh, you know to just push through. Um, I, I don't think we have uh, many questions coming in, but let me just continue with that until we probably do just sort that out. Um, yeah. So until of course we we get a couple of questions in. Um, just to kind of wrap up, uh, each of you, um, some remarks on, on, on two points to it. One, what advice would you give to women who want to come into the industry, either as professionals or as entrepreneurs? And two, can you name two strengths or, or two characteristics as women um, that you think have helped you through your journey, right? From when you, know, you thought about the idea to starting up to actually sustaining it now and scaling um, like many of you are doing. So what advice do you have for people coming in and two strengths as women um, that have taken you through? Uh, Aditi, we could start with you. So in terms of advice, I always say that whatever product or service you intend to sell, first become a master of that. That's extremely important. That's going to be your biggest uh, strength, whether it's uh, your product strength or your sales strength, just become a master of what you do. Second is... Uh, don't overthink it. Be a little bit naive. Be extremely foolish and jump into this thing called entrepreneurship. Don't wait for a safety net. That never happens. Uh, problems exist all the time. Nobody knows how to solve it. You just figure it out yourself. So first become a master of your product and then just take this leap of faith and begin. That's very, very, very important. Two things which I think have uh, helped me sustain the last eight, nine years is I believe a lot in efficiency. I, uh, you know, as the business grows, you realize uh, when you're 24, uh, you're married, you live like bachelors, 24 hours you're working and life is good. And then you have kids and you still have 24 hours and uh, everything becomes a little bit, you know, everything takes more time, but you have fewer hours to give it to it. So efficiency has always been at the center of what I do. That's how do we make this better, faster, and not just for myself, even for all my employees, I say if you do the same thing every day, within a month, what took you eight hours should take you seven hours. That seven hours should become six hours. We have to find a better way of doing it. The second thing which has helped us survive is constantly questioning how can I do what I do better? How uh, This is not just in terms of personal improvement, but can I, my supply chain become more cost effective? Can uh, my sourcing become cheaper? Can my even my own very own product? We work on our product, which has been established in 2013 till date. How do I make this better? Can I take a better grade of flour? Can I uh, source my pumpkin seeds differently? Can I change my orange juice? So always working on making your company and yourself better. These are the two things I feel uh, has helped me grow. Uh, Niharika. Sure. So um, we have this uh, belief at Arugula & Co. That, that we build with intentionality. So if we're doing something, we know why we're doing it. If we are winning, we know why we're winning. If we're losing, we know why we're losing. And we're learning, you know, every, st I mean, it's, it's, I suppose, a better way to say that you're learning along the way. But how do you learn if whatever you were doing was not planned from the outset, right? So everything that we do has a larger vision. It's tied into, you know, three or four different things. And we're always measuring the outcomes. Uh, so build with intentionality. Uh, two characteristics of women that I think are particularly unique to women uh, in, in my very short journey, I've come across uh, compassion and authenticity. Uh, and I think women have this very, very unique ability to, you know, to Aditi and, you know, uh, and Surbhi, like you guys said, that to, to actually build build other people, right? And that comes from a very, very deep place of compassion. And I don't, unfortunately, see a lot of men doing that. Uh, and the second way I think that we actually, you know, communicate with others is, is authenticity. So we're not afraid of, you know, of what the optics might be of saying something. We're not, uh, we're okay to fail and we're okay to fail publicly. And I think that those failures are very, very powerful in terms of actually creating stories and connecting with our consumers and that comes from a place of authenticity. Brilliant. Um, and Surbhi. So 
I, I, I guess one of the most important lessons I learned uh, right from the beginning of having started an entrepreneurship was to know and control your money. So if anyone is coming into business, I know it sounds perhaps a little too pragmatic, but it's just, you have to have control over every rupee and where it's going. And I, I know this from having spoken to so many women over the course of careers that it's, it scares us off, but it shouldn't scare you off because you're managing your own finances every day. It's no different from managing your house. If that's what you're doing, it's no different from managing your schools, kids, fees, educations, all of that. I think it's to know and control your money because at the end of the day, whether you are um, happy and have failed or you are happy and have succeeded, you should know that you have enough for the next day after that. You shouldn't, I think money sometimes becomes the biggest reason for despair as a woman entrepreneur because you don't know where to go after that and you don't want to go back to asking someone else for it. So for me, I think that's the biggest advice I would give to a woman starting off in any business. Uh, and in food businesses, it takes time to grow it. You know, it takes seven, nine years um, to grow a successful business sometimes. So you have to be in control of that. I think in terms of qualities, um, to me, the biggest thing is balance. Uh, for example, balancing humility and confidence. Humility is something that is, is ingrained in a lot of uh, in a lot of us, and we tend to be humble about how successful we are, or humble about how well we've done, or how much we manage. But also have the confidence to come out and say it. And there's no harm in self propagating. You know, it's not it's market it's not marketing yourself. It's saying it as it is. And I think there's a balance to be struck there. And a lot of times we and like we were talking about networking, it's important to learn from other people's experiences but also just as important to balance that with taking a call. Uh, at Happy Jars, we realized in the first year or so that sometimes we were very stuck for taking a decision. And then we stopped and said, you know, there's no one else that's going to take this for us. There are no more points of information that are going to help us take this call. So let's just take it one way or another and then deal with the consequences and be responsible for what happens. So try to learn as much as you can and don't make other people's mistakes again. If you can help that, that's great but also just sometimes take the step and do it because there's no harm. You will not either succeed or fail unless you try. So got to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. So we do have a question. Um, and this of course is something that I can go to all of you on. Uh, the question is that most of you have a co-founder to support. So how important do you think it is as a woman entrepreneur to have one, especially with food businesses, because they're, they're, each product comes with a shelf life. Uh, so maybe if each of you want to just quickly uh, touch, touch upon that. Um, Aditi? Yeah. Um, I think uh, whether you're in a food business or any business, uh, a team always helps. Attempts this team is that you develop. Attempts this team is a co-founder that you have. And I think very, very important because what happens is, you know, I think we're always in a very comfortable point in life where we're talking very uh, happily. But if you ask any one of us how uncertain the first two, three years were, uh, it's extremely traumatic. You have no idea the money that you put in the business is going to survive. Is it going to go down the drain? God knows what's going to happen. And I feel in times like that, the support of a co-founder works extremely well. I know uh, with me and me, we took turns feeling low and depressed. So this year is his... Uh, feeling of being doubtful, I will take on next year. This year, I have to support him or the other way around. So I think having a co-founder uh, takes, like, takes the emotional burden, not away, but you get to share it, which makes the entire journey almost fun then. The, the traumas become a bit more entertaining. So I think a co-founder is a good idea to get on board. <laughs> So, I mean, Aditi, now that you say that, I really miss having a co-founder. So, <laughs> so I'm an only founder. Uh, and yes, the first two years were extremely traumatic. <laughs> uh, but then I think I got really, really lucky. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't have somebody who I wanted to build a business with who had the exact same vision as me. And so I decided to build it myself. But what's been really amazing this past year is that I found an incredible team of people to support me along the way who do have the same vision and in very, very key areas. So uh, if you're a single founder, you, you might go through depression, you might want to tear your hair out, uh, you'll go crazy. But it's not, I'm not saying that it's still not worth it. And, and you know, find, find a good team from the outset to support you and to actually be passionate about the same things that you are. 
I think I, I'm in the middle of both of those opinions. So I think for, for me, it's been, I, I'm a co-founder and the co-founder is my husband. And I'm sure Aditi, you must have a, bin, a million stories as well. But sometimes it's harder to be co-founders than it is to be married. <laughs> and it's like, you just, and you know, there are days when you come back home and you wonder to yourself, yeah, today I was just colleagues, but there's no wife and husband in this house anymore for just, you know, there's a couple of days when you go through that. And uh, I think it's definitely a lot of support to have someone build the build the company with you and to share the bad days and the good days and have someone to high five as well um but i think it's not it's not a make or break you know if like uh, like when harka if your vision is something that's your own and is close to you it's important to f- wait until you find someone who's able to build you up i think having a co-founder having a misfit co-founder is much worse than going it alone so it's it's is exactly like a marriage you need to have someone who helps to build your confidence to build you up to share that but isn't always the one that's staring you down so uh it's not critical to have a co-founder it's, it's very important to have people and i think that's what we've all said that you need to have the team around you you need to have someone who's a sounding board but it needs to be the right kind of fit as well Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I almost don't want to want this to end. Actually, it's just, this has been fun. Uh, but thank you so much. It's been a pleasure speaking to all of you. Um, we don't have any more questions. I think we're going to wrap up. Um, and I'm sure a lot of our viewers would have had uh, tremendous insight in in what it takes to be a woman leader and and how they can actually come in um, and the opportunities. Another very important takeaway, I think, that uh, that people can take out from this, from each of your journeys as well. and the practices that you follow is being mindful of um where your food is coming from how it's processed uh, how it's packaged how it reaches you what you eat and then eventually the overall impact that you have uh, on the environment around you um because i think uh, 2020 is probably taught us that that you can't be exclusive right it's got to be everything that works together and you've got to think about it um and of course this being a women's day Uh, special so that there is um, a couple of lines from a, a, an american uh, poet and an author uh, judy grahan um who I want to actually quote um she says this is just a couple of lines from her main poem but she says that the common woman is as common as the best of bread and will rise and will become stronger i swear it to you so i think that's a message that uh, the women listening in um and aspiring to come in or already in is just follow your passion play to your strengths and just take that leap um and you will make it make it for yourself and of course for the, the people around you uh thank you so much um and of course um just a quick uh, note we are food safety works so we continue a, a monthly webinar series so we look forward to getting feedback on any topics that uh, any of the viewers would be interested in um and feedback on the session as well you can reach us on our email which is feedback@foodsafetyworks.in Um, you can also stay updated on our webinars uh, through our YouTube channel and also follow us on on social media platforms on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Our handle is Food Safety Works. Uh, we regularly share insights and and news about what's going on in the industry and as a company we're of course committed to providing end-to-end solutions uh, to food safety. We conduct online trainings and offline trainings as well as part of this, uh, the FSCI mandate, um the Fast Track trainings. Um, to more, no more. Please do visit our website, which is www.foodsafetyworks.com, and subscribe to our newsletter as well. And thank you so much, uh, Aditi Niharika Surubi. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for sparing your time. Um, you. I look forward to staying connected with you, and I'm I'm sure a lot of people will probably reach out, uh, maybe learn a little bit more. And of course, your fantastic products that you've got. <laughs> um, so thank you, and and the very best. I hope you have a wonderful day and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I've really Take enjoyed uh, meeting Niharika and Surbhi today. It's been yeah. Lovely. Yeah, likewise. Contacting you both after this. So definitely, <laughs> Surbhi, I want to be on your. I want to be on that group. Oh yeah, <laughs> I will. <laughs> lovely. Thank you. Thank you. you too. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.